this is uh, technically about the sea of darkness, but uh, I'm sure that uh, the issues will <coughs> overlap and intersect um, uh, fairly well. Uh, as people are settling down, let me just uh, say a word of thanks once again to Sean Thompson, Michael Oblivitz, Keiko Beatty, uh, and to the staff of the University of California Humanities Research Institute who made this all possible. Um, and we'll spend about an hour uh, going through the panel. And, uh, the format will be much the same as it was before. So Tom, Tom, why don't you start and then I'll go to Rory and... Hey, aloha kako a pau. O po aku ke ali ahunu o kalane ana olu o kuhio stone. My Hawaii ne. So that's just a quick introduction of who I am. Actually, everybody knows me in uh, the surfing world as Tom Stone. But I really don't go by that name. Uh, let me see what else. It's great to be at UCLA. I have never been here. It's, it's a beautiful campus. Uh, mahalo for the opportunity to be here, David. Uh, I'm also a professor at the University of Hawaii, and my area of expertise is Hawaiian history, language, and traditional sports. So I was kind of like freaking out <laughs> listening to, to stuff. A lot of people, you know, Fred's a good guy. I love him for who he is. But go back to school. <laughs> I did. Anything else you need to know about me? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here, man. It's <laughs> really. Oh, yeah, because Mike, Mike asked me to be here. So did David. And I guess I have some expertise in drugs. And I knew, uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, like, like Rory, we knew Mike, boy, very well. Uh, Rasmussen, yeah, they're all friends of ours. I call them friends no matter what happened. Yeah, so I guess that's why I'm going to address Sea of Darkness for you in the way I understand it culturally and how it impacted my way of life. Right, because my actually I walked down the same road as Mike and uh, Rick Rasmussen and a lot of those, you know Jeff and those guys. Definitely, uh, I just kind of survived. That's about it. Greg Escalante, um, artist. Yeah, um, I was impressed by Sea of Darkness because uh, I was a surfer, but not. A, a big name superstar surfer that I saw here and I've seen actually here, it seems like more interesting surfers than I've ever seen <laughs> anywhere in my life. So it was kind of mind blowing. But <clears throat> I was attracted to this film when I saw it because it told a story that actually seemed like it would probably never be, be told. It was like there's no way, there's no market, there's, you know, there's no sponsorship. You know, and maybe people don't want to see it because they're going to see the dark, gnarly, evil side of surfing like they didn't even know it existed. And just over the years, you know, because I've been around for a long time, I couldn't help but hearing some of these stories and, you know, stories like from the last film, you know, um, busting down the door about all that stuff that happened on the North Shore, and, but never really hearing the whole story, you know, so it's so great that that film told the whole story. And then this film told the story, and I probably wouldn't even know about it if it wasn't for a Surfer's Journal article that was a profile on Mike Boyum. And so, and that was pretty mind-blowing, just what I could remember from, from, uh, that story, and when I'm watching the movie, I'm thinking like, man, I've heard that name, I know that guy. <laughs> and the one from the journal is about how he finally made it to the Philippines, he's burnt all his friends, he, um, you know, it's like this master faster, and, and ends up killing himself from fasting, which, I don't know, Michael, if, but wasn't there, a, was it like a Kafka story about the guy that, that was in the, like the carnival and he could fast for all these, you know, days and finally he just went too far, you know. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's just like you can't believe it, but this was like the real life Kafka story. And, it, you know, so, so, um, and it, it's interesting, <laughs> I'm just going to tell this part of it, it's interesting when I, the way I got to see this film, because this is, like I said, this is a film that, it's hard to even watch. It's hard to find out where it's playing. I don't know how much you've gotten it out there. 
but I know this guy named Mike Stison, he was showing this film at, at his college in Laguna, LCAD, uh, art college, and he told me about it, you know, because maybe he was gonna do something with me and I could come early and see Michael's film. And then I thought like, wait a minute, I know that name. <laughs> I know Michael's name. So I had met him because I went and saw a film that I guess a mutual friend of ours made called Spawn that was about meth freaks and, and Michael pulls up and he's in the car and he's got all these surfboards out of it and he had just been surfing Malibu. And anyway, he was just this wild personality. And so I thought, wow, here's a chance to meet that guy again. <laughs> you know? So I'll finish my little spiel up in a minute. But the thing that was good that the course wasn't shown in this movie and you, 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 know, you can't get a feel of it <laughs> is when he walked in to that, to that class and the students were there, he started like giving them a lecture that I think went for about at least 25 minutes that was just almost like politically incorrect where he was talking about politicians and who they should vote for and just like the wildest stuff ever, but really maybe the best speech I'd ever heard. <laughs> so, so I think he's got some real talent and he made a cool film and we can go to the next guy. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Kempton. Uh, my name's Jim Kempton, and I think I got asked to come here because back in a past life, I was the editor and then publisher of Surfer Magazine, um, <laughs> and therefore, uh, therefore knew all of these characters during this era. But funnily enough, uh, both of these films uh, have a personal relationship to me. One is that uh, in uh, 1974, I was actually uh, in Bali, uh, I didn't meet any of those guys, but I met a lot of other people who were there. Uh, and uh, then later, uh, much later, uh, after, after the Indies Trader had, uh, had turned into a, a Quicksilver crossing boat, uh, I was the director of the, that boat that you saw sailing around those waters for about four years uh, at Quicksilver through a great deal of the world. Uh, and the same thing goes, I guess, before I was at Surfer with uh, Busting Down the Door, uh, I was actually I was actually at Surfer when Rabbit wrote that story, but uh, but before that, I was on the North Shore just as a as a punk kid going surfing and and wanting to be where uh, where all the action was, and so was able to witness uh, what went on there, uh, and made sure I didn't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, that's my that I I think that's why they invited me here. <coughs> Paul Holmes. Hi, uh, my name's Paul Holmes. And um, actually, this guy sitting next to me, Jim Campton, when he was publisher of Surfer, hired me to be editor at Surfer. <laughs> so we kind of, we're in sequence here. This, <laughs> this was the order of events. Um, I, have a, I was at an event a few weeks ago and picked up this bumper sticker. It says, surfing ruined my life. <laughs> And, um, you know, in a sense, it, it is ironic, it's supposed to be funny, um, but, you know, in a sense, um, all of the uh, things we've been discussing here today kind of do pertain to people's obsessions and addictions to surfing, um, and some of the complications that ensue thereafter. I know for me it did, because I grew up in England, and it started surfing in the very early 60s, uh, at a time when there was probably only two dozen people surfing in the entire country. We were kind of out there in no man's land as far as surfing was concerned. We had to make our own wetsuits. I mean, that's, a, that's how crude it was. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, as a 13, 14 year old, I became totally obsessed with surfing. Um, I did manage to finish my grammar school education. Um, and as I did so, people around me who, uh, you know, my parents and teachers and the grammar school principal kept saying to me, you know, surfing's going to ruin your life. <laughs> I heard that so many times I can't even tell you. But I was, <laughs> I was determined to somehow make it the central focus of my life in the same way that everybody you've seen up here today has made it the central focus of their lives. The thing was... In the late 60s and early 70s, there really weren't too many options in terms of how 
to make surfing the central focus of your life, how to schedule everything in your life around the waves and the tides, and still make a living. How could you do that? There just weren't that many options. You could be a surfboard maker, a surfboard shaper. You could be a surfboard, a, a surfing magazine journalist or work at a surfing magazine or make a movie, uh, perhaps, and make some money making a movie. But beyond that, the, 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 there were severe limitations. Now, all of this is going on at a time when surfing is starting to ripple out. It did for me. I moved from uh, England to Australia in 1973, and I worked in a, uh, making surfboards. I worked at a surf magazine. Um, ultimately, I became the contest promoter and d director of the 2SM Coca-Cola Surf About, which, which was one of the first um, world tour events in Sydney. And actually, at the time, the richest pro contest in the world. Um, and at the same time all this is going on, people are going to different places, finding new places to surf. And of course, you know, wherever that happens, this whole um, globalization and this clash of cultures starts to come into play. Um, in those days, in the early 70s and the mid 70s, what surf travel meant for most people was a backpack and a surfboard and an air ticket and your passport, some money, head off into the world and find some place to go surfing. I mean, we used to pour over the maps looking at places to surf. No, there wasn't any information. There was no internet, of course. Uh, you know, it was like we were flying blind. But what happened was when you go to a place like Bali or Java or many other places, you know, in Africa or, or Morocco, whatever, Inevitably, you were dependent on the local people to house you and feed you and, you know, kind of, you, you really had to interact with the local culture in order to find those places to surf. So, I do remember being in Bali probably about the same time Jim was, uh, 74, 75, I met Mike Boyum. I thought he was a creepy guy. <laughs> I mean, really did, you know, the whole vibe of him was like weird, you know. I couldn't explain exactly why, but I, he, he just seemed like a really creepy person. <laughs> and um, at that time, they were just setting up the, the uh, camp at G-Land. And I remember, you know, I was talking to some buddies, but they want a hundred dollars a day to go there to surf. They're out of their mind. It was anathema to us. Those of us who are out there on the road looking for places to surf with a backpack and a board, paying some guy, some American guy, $100 a day to go surfing, out of the question. We never went, be just simply because of that. And at that time, there was plenty of good surfing to be had just on Bali, you know, at Uluwatu or Padang or Nusa Dua or Sanor. I mean, there was plenty of good places to surf. It hadn't become crowded. Could have beach was a little fishing village. There were no discos. There wasn't even electricity. <laughs> Once the sun went down, it was a dark little town. <laughs> so um, I think it's really kind of interesting, many of the topics that are being brought up with both of these movies. Um, the, the commercialization of surfing and the professionalization of surfing and the whole uh, way that the surfing has rippled out of late uh, exported to many, many countries around the world and sort of imprinted mostly with the marketing messages of the big surfwear companies has had a profound effect, um, I think, on surfing. And, you know, what's kind of ironic about these boat trips is, um, you know, you, you pay your, your way, you go meet the boat in some place, you jump on the boat, you looked after, you eat frozen food out of the fridge, um, you don't interact with the local people at all. And um, that's really created some serious problems in some areas. In Bali, um, when people started first uh, surfing Uluwatu, Uluwatu was a dirt poor village of the worst order. I mean, poverty ruled. Um, it was in a bad part of the island. They didn't have much water. And actually, the coming of surfing to Uluwatu changed the lives of the people who lived in that village and made them prosperous. 
Uh, it's a really complicated story, uh, but um, I think it's really good that USCLA is hosting this event. It's about time some of these issues were discussed. And um, I applaud the, uh, the people who are putting this on. Thank you very much. Uh, just a point of correction. We're physically, physically located at uh, UCLA, but uh, the, the event is actually sponsored by a University of California-wide uh, research institute. Uh, this is just the location we, uh, we managed to choose. Jericho Poplin. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm in the wrong movie. <laughs> no, not really. Not really. No, I love this. I really love, and I really love your movie, Michael, because it made me scared. Because I remember as a young woman growing up, in the sport of surfing, and I was in the sport of it, but I was in the traveling part of it too. And I went to a lot of these places, and you know, what was I doing there? But it's because I wanted to surf these waves, and I wasn't thinking about, oh, these guys or, or anybody else. I just wanted to do that. I grew up in Long Beach, California, uh, uh, five brothers, and I'm the only girl. And uh, I could have done any sport. I grew up dancing all my life. I decided after, you know, watching uh, weird movies from Gidget to whatever, you know, hey, this is what I want to do. And I've danced all my life. I'm involved with the arts. Uh, but what happened is I grew up with all these boys. And um, my dad, he said, just do what you want to do. So... <laughs> I wanted to surf. I wanted to dance on these waves all over the world. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I did it, and I'm still doing it. And what I saw in your movie is the addiction of riding waves and whatever it takes or took in your movie and in the Bustin' Boys movie. It's like we were all doing, there were very few women but we were all doing whatever it would take for us to fulfill our addictions, uh, addiction of riding waves. And um, so I don't want to talk about women issues <laughs> because that's slim, slim surface stuff compared to what you guys are really getting at. You know, it's like we were all there, like PT said. We wanted to make surfing our lives and we had whatever it took. To, to say, okay, it's a clothing line, or we're going to be a contest director like Paul was way ahead of his time doing that, the way he structured stuff. Or Fred, I mean, God bless Fred, you know? <laughs> I mean, we all just did the best we knew, knew how from the parents and the situations and the cultures that we were coming from South Africa, all these different cultures, and we all still, to this day, share that joy of riding what is a wave, a freaking vibration from a storm <laughs> that nobody owns out there in the ocean. I mean, it hits Australia, it hits Hawaii, it hits California, but we're after that joy. And so I, I have a lot of passion for my brothers here my brother surfers. And I have, I have admiration also for those weird guys that were doing whatever they could in your movie. You know, I mean, really. It wasn't moral or ethical, I don't think. But uh, that's what they did to ride waves. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions for me <laughs> but we can talk story later. Uh, Rory Russell. Hi, Hello, everybody. My name is Rory Russell, and I was born in Germany. My father was a very highly decorated Army colonel. Um, we got sent to Hawaii in 1964, August 4th, first time I stepped foot in the Hawaiian Islands. I didn't go there on purpose. I wanted to be a baseball player. 
But uh, yeah, I ran away from home because I was going to Hawaii. <laughs> Thank God I didn't make it. But um, yeah, and so as far as you know, culture and lifestyles and everything, there's probably no more bigger opposite end of the spectrum than having a highly decorated military officer having a <laughs> pro server for a son. Uh, it was kind of hard for us to see eye to eye, but he was always out fighting war, so we never had a chance to see eye to eye that much, which is a shame. Um, the, uh, as far as the cultural thing, there's, there's two sides to every story, and it's a catch-22. We're talking about the Hawaiian culture, the Australian culture, but basically we're all talking about the same culture, and that's the culture we all share is surfing. Everybody has sat here, and everybody has talked about the greatest feeling in their life is surfing, and it is true. I was on a very rigid pleasure program for a number of years, and it caught up to me five years ago, and I died, I literally died from congestive heart failure. Well, you guys saw me in Australia that time. Ooh. Anyhow, thank God that the doctor was a surfer and recognized me and got two other doctors in, and they worked for three and a half hours, and uh, basically you could say I saw the light. <laughs> but uh, they say one out of a thousand makes it from where I was, but you know what? When I was there, the most important thing was my friends and surfing. You know, it was something that, that saved my life. And, um, and as far as, you know, the cultural, the excitement of it, I have a surfing school. I teach surfing. And I have a, everybody signed my guest book. And I bet everything that they wrote in that book, we've all felt rose are red, violets are blue. Rory made me stand up and saved my life, too. <laughs> The greatest feeling of my entire life, even by marriage, you know, you, you name it. And, it and, it's, and it's true, you know. It doesn't matter how good a surfer you are, the best surfer in the water is the one who's having the most fun. And we all know that part, you know. So this cultural and this, and this competition thing was good for the, for the essence of, of professional surfing, Unfort which is really good because then that helps alleviate the, the drug culture, which is basically was brought about because if you're gonna surf, you gotta commit 100% all the time. So you can't hold a regular job. I mean, half the guys that I grew up with that were good surfers that I went to high school with, as soon as they got out of high school, they stopped surfing. That was the end of their surfing career. They got married, they had a local kid, they, they married a local girl, they had local kids, and they had to provide for their family. Okay, now basically the only way that, that the surfers that they would come from other places the only way they could come to the North Shore and exist in a comfortable lifestyle was to bring drugs, you know? Bring drugs to Hawaii and sell it to the, the locals and we'll take their money and live off their land and steal their ways or whatever, you know? So it was, you know, it, it, it itself was a culture. I could tell you stories of nightmares, you know? That I've been on both ends of the gun. Huh? <laughs> I know. We both did, both did. And like Fred Deming said, you know, this kid, Rusty Starr, Rusty was a good friend. It, Rusty Starr was a very good friend of mine. He was born the day before I was. And my friend came by my house. I was at Fat Paul's house. My friend Bill Lacey came by and said, Rusty died last night. I just went by your mom's house. Your mom told me Rusty died last night shooting cocaine. Couldn't wait to go home for dinner that night. But I tell you, it was a wake-up call, you know. We all have addictions. We all have wants. We all have needs. It's a matter of knowing your limitations and what's, what's good for you and what's bad and what's good for, for your surroundings, for your environment, the people that you deal with, as far as whether it's alcohol or drugs or anything, you know. It's all out there. It's all out there. It's up to you to know how much you want out of life and how much love you've got to give and how much you want to share that, you know, so that you don't blow it, you know. I've come, we've all been right there, man. I've been right there and thank God I didn't blow it, you know. And I'm still here, and I'm surfing again, man. I lost 80 pounds. I used to be 250 pounds. Yes, you were. But after I, yeah, man. And I'm fucking ripped, too. <laughs> if I would have known I was still with this kid at this age, I would have never stopped. Freaking Lopez told you to retire gracefully. <laughs> never uh, listen to him again. <laughs> Rory, you, you were at G-Land early on. Can you speak a bit about that? Yeah, we went to jail. Boyan, Boyan was a very arrogant guy. He, had a, he was a devil, basically. He had a devilish grin. Um, he, he was in it for himself, you know. He, he wanted to charge 100 bucks to go surfing, you know, which for us is absurd, you know, because it's free. But um, Boyan had his own agenda and what he was doing, and he, was, he really liked to be in the limelight and be the center of attention. 
And like I said, you know, the way to make a living without having to work, smuggle drugs. You know, there's so many drug smugglers came to the North Shore over all the years. You'd be surprised the names that, that pop up. But that's neither here nor there now, you know. The main thing is that we all keep focus on the surfing aspect of life and then, you know, follow through on that, man. And we'll all stay here and be happy and groove and have fun. <laughs> That's about all I have to say. Just stay surfing, man. Just stay in the water. Um, uh, the, the period uh, that, that both films address, really the early 1970s to the early 1980s, is a period of, um, you could say, quite dramatic transition uh, in, in surfing culture and surfing lifestyle from uh, one of a kind of countercultural... Uh, travel the world on your own dime kind of phenomenon, looking, at, looking for adventure and waves and uh, an experience uh, of, of youth, mainly young men, uh, and, and so on, seeking things out, um, to a period uh, off, after that, we're still here, which yeah. is really about the globalization of, of uh, surf culture and a surf industry uh, and its commercialization in some sense. And, and uh, I just want to pose a general question to the, to the panel about the, I mean, we've addressed some of the um, complex issues that are associated with that transition, but I wonder if you can, uh, you know, you can begin to talk and tease out some of the concerns in relation to each of the two, two movies as they go along. So maybe, Jim? You, yeah. um. uh, well, I, I think what you saw in both of these movies that I think was the common thread was that it was a period in which surf, surfing had come of age or was trying to come of age. The question that all of us were saying to one another is how do we keep doing this? Because in the previous time, you know, when I was 10, uh, I saw Gidget. And you know, people who were older made fun of Gidget, but if you were 10, it was the greatest, I mean, after I'd seen Gidget, I didn't want to be an astronaut, I didn't want to be a cowboy, I didn't want to be a policeman, I wanted to be a surfer. That movie changed my life because when I saw it, that's all I wanted to do. But what I didn't like was the ending. The ending was, at the end of the summer, the one guy went back to work and the other guy went back to college. Well, I'd already graduated from college. So I wanted to know, how do you keep doing what they were doing that summer all the time? And I think that's what everybody my age was trying to figure out. We were trying to figure out how to do that. So in a certain sense, we invented this culture and we invented this industry because we wanted it to succeed. And funnily enough, people talk about America and, and competition, but in the surfing world, if you look at the, at the development of the surfing industry, it was all about cooperation. Everybody wanted everyone to succeed because if they succeeded, it meant maybe you could. And so whether you were a surfboard manufacturer or a contest director or an editor of a magazine or you sold clothes, or you made board shorts, whatever it took, you made movies, everyone was out there trying to be able to make a living and still do what we all love to do. And that, that development is really the, the sort of uh, first inklings of what the surf industry was to become, a, you know, a billion, billion dollar industry that was worldwide. And before the, before the contests, came about, uh, there was a whole other structure of how you sort of made your way in surfing. Had you surfed Bali? Had you surfed uh, La Bar and Biarritz? Had you surfed, uh, you know, Noosa Heads? There were these places in the world that you were supposed to go and you were supposed to find, and then you were supposed to find new ones. Uh, and and that, was, that was sort of what we were all out there doing. And when the professionalism came along, what it opened up was a lot of opportunities for everyone to get a job. <laughs> you know, there's, oh, sorry. I think the basic thing that we're talking about right here, and I don't think very many people know this, is there is one single greatest invention in surfing that has created this giant population of surfers. Does anybody know what that is? You got it, the leg rope. When I first saw the leg rope at Chun's, I was paddling out with Jim Sutherland, I saw this guy fall up, his board popped up, and it, fall off on the wave, his board popped up next to him. I said, God, that guy's lucky. His board popped up right next to him. <laughs> I paddled back out, the guy fell off on his board and popped up right next to him. I said, that guy's really lucky. His board popped up. <laughs> and then I saw the bracelet, I mean, the anklet on his thing, and I 
surfing was over for me then because I knew it would just get so crowded and that's why nobody has to swim like we used to have to swim. You swim at sunset, you lose your board at sunset at the takeoff, you're out of the water for half an hour, 20 minutes, right? You know, with a leg rope, you're right back in the lineup, you know? So basically, surfers never got to get discouraged. See, if I would have had to grow up in California, I probably would have never surfed because it's too cold. I, without a leg rope, no way, you know? But, but with the, uh, you know, the invention of the leg rope, man, you fall off, you're right back up. It, it helped with the, with the design of the surfboard. The guy could ride the same way more often, more often. Helped with the, with the production of the surfboard. It, it was the biggest single factor in surfing and making it as big as it is today. And it led to the position where Jim was just saying, we can make the trunks for all those surfers. We can make the t-shirts for all those surfers that are now wanting to jump in the water and share the fun. You know, I want to try and like, try to bring the two movies together because they were basically about the same thing. And that's this, sent, you know, this, this pop culture that originates out of a founding culture. Right, so there's like levels of that, that that permeate, you know, from a tradition that was just a way of life for, because no matter what, I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion about what the origins of surfing, for example. Trust me, it began in Hawaii, and that's that. <laughs> you know, unless somebody, you know, because, hey, you know what, I spent too much time with the magazines and everybody else arguing them, you know, but the one thing you gotta produce is the artifact. If you don't have the artifact, you can say anything you want, but you can never be, you know, produce the foundation to support your hypothesis. And that's the fact is that we have all the stories and the, we have all the physical evidence of it. So surfing is from Hawaii. It's a gift to the world that from the Australian point of view that Duke brings to them. Right? And that's founded on something that he did as a way of life. And it's that way of life that goes forward and it, it becomes the foundation from which everybody else embraces surfing. And surfing becomes, you know, a tradition based on a culture that creates another culture. And that's what we all belong to. And I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not only a native, but Sorry, I come from the same roots as everybody else that surfs, right? We're all surfers of a contemporary time period. But it's that foundation. And from that, everybody's looking for a way of life, like the Gidget story, right? That's technically, uh, you know, uh, who's that guy, man? The big guy that played with her all the time? On, 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 oh, oh, the big kahuna, right? So that's Greg Noel, right? <laughs> really, it's all about Greg Noel and those guys. Yeah? And they're coming to Hawaii and embracing all this stuff. But it's having that way of life that's founded on a native way of life. And I'm not saying it was Greg No. I'm just saying that the imagery produced, maybe Greg No took that from, from the Gidget movies, who knows. But it's that foundation that everybody steps onto and begins to leap into the future of surfing. And from it, there's, you know, the loss of the nativeness becomes the connection to how do you live and be a surfer without competitive roots in you, but the roots that's form, founded on, on, on a cultural practice. So drugs becomes a very unique way of you know, taking care of your addiction to surf as many ways as you can and go as many places. And, you know, Rory's right. You know, without naming names, we know a lot of very influential people in Hawaii today that made their way on drugs. I mean, it's just the way it was. I mean, the, the flow of drug traffic into Hawaii out of the west through Hanalei and Maui and stuff like that was phenomenal. I was there. I was part of it. I knew Mike. I, you, know, I, you know, I knew the guys. I knew Eddie, that, er, that, that Fred hates, eminently, <laughs> and I could say Eddie's name. Eddie was in the movie. I mean, <laughs> he was there, but, you know, but, hey, somebody better have a bottle of beer or something, man, if you keep <laughs> dropping bottles. I know, yeah, but, you know, that's the connection between the two movies is looking at 
changes on one side, still founded on that same principles of a traditional practice that's embraced. And for anybody to say that Hawaiians weren't competitive, we were very competitive. We always were for centuries. Competition was really important, except competition was life and death. You know? And then came the 20th century when uh, the annexationists and Alexander Hume Ford came up with this brilliant idea and they, and they invited Jack London. And Jack London didn't have money, his wife had money. And that's what they were attracting. And that was the foundation to, to begin tourism was having Jack London come write the stories in the women's magazine to attract all the wealthy women of the world to come to Hawaii. And, and that's how it begins to get started. But it's, it's all of this cultural foundation that, is, that's, that really lays out the way it is. Com competition on one side and the free spirit of surfing on the other side. And the free spirit of surfing, that's the way we're gonna make it, you know, by, by running drugs. Damn, we ran a lot of drugs. And then the other side was the guys that came up. Yeah, shit, I was pissed off at you, you know, I was pissed off at Sean and everybody else, but I chose a different route. I left surfing just as they were arriving. I walked away from it because I was so deeply and grounded in the drug culture of surfing that if I didn't, I was gonna die. Just like Rasmussen died, you know. Everybody can talk about all kind of shit, but trust me, I know what was going down. And I walked away because too many people were dying. And, you know, I heard it. You know, I heard of everything going on on the North Shore in that period between 74 and 76. But I wasn't a part of it anymore. I didn't want to be a part of it. I chose not to be a part of it. And so today, you know, I can walk around and look at what I really call, you know, my, my foundation of surfing. And that's because it's my traditions. It's my way of life. I was born to surf. Yeah. So, you know, that's the culture. So come together. Paul. You know, um, Tom brings up, you know, some really interesting stuff with that, uh, not least of which, you know, the origins and traditions um, of surfing, some, some of which have tended to become a little bit lost in all of the hoopla over, well, professional surfing. Um, not that I'm uh, denigrating world professional surfing. I think it's been a wonderful thing, still is. And uh, contrary to some of the opinions that were expressed a little earlier, I think it's just as exciting today as it's ever been, if not more so. I mean, um, the ability to be able to watch a major world tour contest live on the internet is absolutely fantastic, you know. Anyway, that's beside the point. The point I was going to make was, you know, um, Tom is so right, you know, obviously surfing originated in Hawaii, I think it's an incontrovertible fact, um, was long, long established there, but it, the crucible of modern surfing is right here in California for uh, a number of reasons, um, climate, reasonably, you know, good weather, beaches, waves, aerospace, because it was out of the aerospace industries we got foam and fiberglass surfboards, and finally, uh, as Jim was mentioning, uh, Hollywood. Hollywood, Gidget movies, beach blanket movies, and the Beach Boys. All of those things gave rise to this first spurt of uh, surfing as a youth culture phenomenon and a fad. Uh, that, that's the springboard. You know, when the, the first uh, surfers started coming from California to, and to visit Hawaii, and it's always been like the great pilgrimage, I think, for, for any surfer. You, you have to go to the islands if you're going to call yourself a surfer. And the first Californians to do so inevitably brought back with them uh, some of the things that they sort of picked up while they were over there. You know, they came back with the, uh, the palm frond uh, hats, and they came back with the, the, you know, the ukulele, and they came back with... <laughs> With Rush the ass. slippers, yeah, <laughs> and on all of that stuff, and you know, the surf culture in California, as it was in the uh, uh, the forties and fifties and early sixties, was was infused with a lot of this uh, Hawaiian, um, at least the artifacts, mm. uh, and and part of part of the um, 
the attitude as well, I think. You know, they were uh, laid back, you know, surf first, um, you know, uh, take it easy, <laughs> you know. Uh, all of that stuff was part of that. And we've kind of, to some extent, lost track of that in, uh, in the great growth of surfing and its uh, commercialization. The fact of the matter is, I mean, <clears throat> we all wanted, as Jericho was saying, to do, you know, to try to structure our lives around going surfing. So that was the first thing. And the, the other thing, making a living or whatever, even if some of us, not me, but others became drug smugglers to do it, uh, everything else came second, you know. Um, today, you know, the fact is that uh, if you get a job with a, a big surfwear company, you're going to work a nine-to-five job, and you're going to go surfing on the weekends like all the other suckers, you know. <laughs> you, you're not going to get to pick and choose necessarily. The only people who get to do that anymore are the pro surfers. Of course, there's a lot more pro surfers today than there was in the mid-70s when busting down the door was made, when it was really limited to maybe oh, 40, 50 people. Max, you know, today there's like hundreds of them. <laughs> That's <laughs> I'm not sure where I was going with that, but somewhere. <laughs> oh, I forget. Yeah. I, uh, okay. I, I, I wanted just to make make a comment about the two movies that I thought yeah. also was was part of them, and and that was uh, they both talked about or both kind of showed the commitment with surfing. I think if there's one word that it means when you're a surfer. It's that you've got to commit. You commit when you go over the face of the wave. You commit when you decide to be a surfer and know that you're not going to have the kind of job that everyone else says if you want to surf. And uh, I kind of learned that w when I first got the job at Surfer, I, I got sent over to Hawaii. And, and uh, one of the guys that, that was over there, Steve Wilkins, who was a, a, a major photographer at the time, took me under his wing a, a, as a young associate editor. And he took me down to Waikiki and he introduced me to this guy, Conrad Kuna, who was uh, sort of... He, he sort of held court where Duke had always held before, and he was the guy that told the stories. He was the beach boy, and and uh, at the moment that I got there, I saw this beautiful board he had, and I and I commented on it, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, that was the board I had with my third wife." He said, um, "Yeah," she said to me, "Conrad, it's either me or that board." Shit, man, it wasn't even that good a board. <laughs> And that's when I knew that commitment was a big part of surfing. I agree. It still has his board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Board's still there. You know, I, I just have this idea, because I, I want to tie the movies together, you know. Um, you know, there's that, that dark side, and then there's that other side, the... Uh, it was like the light side with the Bustin' Boys and all that. And... Um, uh, Oh, I don't know. I, I want to tie that together as actually, the, of course, the beginning of professionalism for us, us, our crew, and for the kids that are there now. And it was the beginning of the true uh, surf culture, I believe, of what it is today. Everything before this time of the 70s and the board development like Reno was impressing us upon, every and the drugs or whatever, but this was the turning point for professionalism yeah. and the surf culture with what it is today. So. Yeah, I was gonna open it up, so Sean. Um, you know, 1946, my late father was attacked by a shark on the beachfront in, in Durban, South Africa. He went to San Francisco for surgery and then recuperated in, in Hawaii. He stayed at the Royal and he met the whole Kahanamoku family. Duke had been his hero because he was a, he was a, he, my father was a champion swimmer as well. And Duke Kahanamoku was a hero in, in our household and when I grew up he was, he was my hero. In fact, my, my son Luke is born on the same day on the 24th of August as Duke Kahanamoka, as is Michael Thompson, also born on and Duke, Mickey, so Mickey birthday. Mickey yeah, so Duke, Duke is, you know, has, has always been a hero uh, in, in our household in South Africa. And Duke, in terms of the globalization of surf culture, obviously introduced surfing to Australia um, and is a great hero. There's a wonderful statue of Duke in, in pit water, in, 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 in fresh water in, in Australia. But I don't really read much today about 
Duke and this wonderful creed that he had in the context of Hawaii. And I wondered whether he is as revered in Hawaii and he's part of the, um, his principles are taught and he's as revered as he is in other parts of the world. And you as a, as a professor of education would, would know this. I was just curious about this fact because he's been such a powerful. Well, you know, to a, to a certain extent, I guess I could answer a little bit about that, Sean, is that one, um, the ownership of his name, you know, use rights and stuff, don't belong to the family or Hawaii anymore. It belongs to someone that has control over that. So it's really minimized how much we can more or less celebrate him, but we do in August, right? So uh, I happen to be part of it, you know, twice, but I realized that there really wasn't much going on, and this is just my own opinion, right? That most of it was just centered around promoting the hotels and the, ind you know, the tourism industry around Waikiki. What I was fortunate enough to do just recently, I just returned from Washington, D.C. Uh, a few days ago where I was asked to come and actually make the boards and uh, other sports implements for the museum that celebrates uh, Duke Onomoku at the National uh, Museum of Indian, of American Indians. So he's, you know, he's recognized there for his, you know, his great sportsmanship, his his uh, sharing the sport or and the traditional practice throughout the world. I mean, today in Hawaii, yeah, there isn't much going on. I mean, it's celebrated more in Australia and Africa than than it is in Hawaii. I mean, it's just not. I mean, I ask that question all the time. What the hell? Was that? Who owns the night? A restaurant. <laughs> A Rigger Canoe Club. <laughs> yes, there is. Because I know a little bit about it. It's going to happen in Australia uh, in, in 2014. And three entities fight over. That's why you've never yeah. seen a Duke movie. But what a great movie, right? What a, what a movie that should be made about his life and winning Olympic medals. And the reason the movie doesn't happen is because no one can agree on who is actually going to be in charge. Yeah. Uh, you saw right. Tom, just quickly. Isn't there a way to separate? I mean, Duke did exist, and he was a real person, and he had extremely powerful influence. Isn't there not a way to uh, di dichotomize, you know, the real Duke from the marketed Duke in the, in the tradition of the Hawaii? Was it just become so distorted because it's become a restaurant chain? You know, I think... And it, Again, it's just the way I, I see it and perceive it, is that what is memorialized elsewhere outside of Hawaii is not the, dis, you know, the business aspect of it all. What's memorialized and I appreciate is the fact is that the spirit he bought, right? Mm -hmm. Not only the competitiveness of it, but that you guys, Aussies and South Africans alike, you know, and other people around the world, I am just in shock. Is that because you guys memorialize him, celebrate him for that spirit he bought as that we all call aloha today, you know? I mean, we use that word a lot, but how many people really know what aloha means? And aloha, when he says it, is just, it's the coming together of two people face to face and you're sharing your spirit with one another. And I think, I know, not that I think, I know that he, he shared that and I appreciate from my point of view as a native that you guys continue to celebrate that without the commercialization of it all. I Paul? appreciate it. Paul? I think, um, I think I can speak, this would be, a, no, you this, can't. This would be an, a, a, an unusual first. I think I can speak for Fred Hemmings um, <laughs> in saying that um, I know what he'd say if he was still sitting up here. He'd say, yeah, Sean, you're right. And Hawaii has a terrible track record of not celebrating Duke Hanamoku and not celebrating its special place in surfing and not getting behind surfing as a pro sport and not creating infrastructure around surfing, which surely is the most important sporting contribution Hawaii has made to the world. I mean, it's one of his hobby horses. 
uh, and has been, you know, in his long life as a politician. Um, and I think there's, there is some truth to that, isn't there? Are you asking me? Yeah. You, know, you know, I'd like to say something. Yes, go ahead, Jeff. You know, in Hawaii, in the school systems, there's no uh, surfing programs. Oh, no. I tell they just, I mean, no. like, yeah, maybe PT recently. can tell us about this, but I mean, like, at the university or any of the junior colleges, no. they haven't Sorry. cultivated no. I wrote surfing. It. I wrote it five years ago, the curriculum. Okay, yes. but like, it's, it still hasn't evolved, just as we're talking about celebrating Dukes, you know. Yeah, well. You know, and here, you know, like uh, Jesus in Jerusalem. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh -oh. who was he? Another guy with the long hair and a beard. But, <laughs> you know, here we are, Hawaii. <laughs> now you know the why they left the girls out. Of modern surfing. And um, they, they do have that week long Duke Festival yeah. where athletes come, they fly in and spend a lot of money to do water polo, all those sports besides surfing. So it's, it's celebrated. Go yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but I think that brings us also to the idea of surfing is still not an Olympic sport. And look at all the <laughs> sports that have raveled off of surfing, skateboarding, windsurfing, snowboarding. They're all Olympic, and here we are, the big rogue water sport from Duke Hanamoko, <laughs> and we're still avant-garde in the sea of darkness, <laughs> traveling, and we're, I, I think that's an interesting idea to contemplate too. In regards to the Olympics in 2016, the country of Brazil is planning on doing a surfing exhibition as part of their Olympics participation. Finally, finally, well, we've all been waiting. <laughs> yes, this is true, but uh, I just met last week with the managing director for the U.S. Olympic team, and, and yeah, there is discussion about it, but it, nobody's really sold on it yet, so there will be ongoing meetings with the Olympic committees worldwide to establish that, maybe. Do you know why, then, that I recently read that kitesurfing is, in fact, going to be Well, I mean, I think the boys that were up here earlier pretty much addressed a lot of it, especially when it came to competition, because a lot of it is, and correct me if I'm wrong, very subjective. Even if you got a criteria that you base things on, it still comes out. It's what the eye sees, right? And, and every wave is not the same. It's not identical. Everything changes, it, and it becomes a very difficult thing to judge because... Trust me, you can, on one wave, Kelly can be killing it, and then on the next wave, somebody can be just as good, but because the focus is on Kelly, it, you know, it gets lost in that, so. It's really hard. And, and you guys want to, you guys should yeah, address I, that. I think that's right. Hey, Tom's right. The, uh, the, the biggest impediment to surfing in the Olympics is the fact that it's got a subjective judging system, and that you can't deliver up every wave the same. The Olympic committee like sports where you know you get a hundred meters everybody runs the same track with a stopwatch first guy across the line is a winner nobody can argue with that unfortunately um, but there are lots of subjective uh, yeah, elements and they've, in, they've always in been Olympic problematic. judging I mean it's <laughs> gymnastics or uh, exactly. that's why they don't want any more that's they right. have so many problems with boxing and gymnastics already with subjective judging they don't want any more subjective sports yeah. And, and yeah, that's one of the biggest, that and the, the fact that um, there's uh, not enough countries that can do it. And so for Europe, it's kind of meaningless mostly, and until they develop a wave pool system that yeah. consistently can right. give the same... I think that's the biggest criteria, PT. Well, 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 you know, we, we all know that, but to do the wave pool system, it costs lots of money. Yeah. Yeah. The other lots meaning of, of making waves. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, in, uh, after about 20 years of surfing, I found a, a perfect beach, little funky beach town and spent, did what any surfer would do. I spent all my money and then some, bought a lot outside of the country, <laughs> out of Hawaii, um, ate beans for a while, etc. Um, at that time, I went down there and there were two small surf shops 
one surf school, and eight years later there are 17 surf schools, five surf shops, and an internet presence, and um, there's some, a major surf company down there too, and I and million dollar houses. So obviously the surf culture has had it in the internet has had a huge impact. Um, my my point is that the surf companies are not, for the most part, are not giving back other than for contests. And I want to know what is the responsibility of someone that is transforming a culture so drastically that what are they supposed to, what is their responsibility? Moral for obligation. Yeah. The moral obligation right. to Thank making you. so much money off the yeah. benefiting They're making them. money off it. And Put it in their back right. pocket. <laughs> Well, I think that's actually uh, that, that question is is a you know in surfing is a microcosm of of uh, what's happening in in our world in general, the commercialization of everything, uh, and and the people who have that commercialization making the rules for whatever the culture or the activities are, uh, and how far we want to allow that to go, and how much we want our culture to be richer. Uh, and more diverse in other ways. So, I mean, I think the, the question is, uh, I think that's up up to surfers. You know, I, I think I, I don't think I don't think that uh, that the brands uh, can be blamed for what they're doing. That's what that that's that's their their responsibilities. What we have to do is not allow that to run us over like a truck, and keep the rich heritage of surfing intact. And that's what why we applaud the people who are here that are brought who have come here and also the people who have helped put it on because this is these these discussions only happen in places like this. You know oh yeah. sorry you want I to just want to follow up. How is surfing any different from any other corporate enterprise? Well uh, you know well, corporate enterprise isn't any different. Well uh, I mean what we we read our, we we position ourselves as being this special, you know, fun loving culture, but if it's really just about cash in the end and you don't give anything back, you know, it's like what Tom's point about, you know, being a, an original source, you know, we're just taking and we're not giving and we're not creating and as Fred said, the future doesn't look great. Well, well, you know, just so I can just say something and I'm, you know what, I'm going to call on you right after just because Ian said something, right, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody caught it, but he said, yeah, when the I think it was you that said it that, you know, and then surfing took a, took a dive. Surfing industry took a dive. And they had reached a point, I believe, that was just draining them profit-wise. And at this point, and where I've been standing for many years, because my part in surfing was that I was just an active surfer, very vocal, and sorry, I surf good, man. I still surf good today. It's just that, you know, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have that competitive burn in me. That it's, you know, but on, on, on any given day, I could outsurf any one of these guys. But competitively, they could, they, they would just shred me. But the thing is, what's changing today, if anybody stops and looks at the small little movements of the industry to continue to capitalize, is they're slowly fading or kind of distancing themselves from, from the surfing competitions. They're becoming, they're, it's coming full circle again. And they're slowly starting to move out into this adventurism and to search for surf and to go out and surf for the fun of it again. And they're, you know, they're taking the, you know, the, you know, the best surfers today. Like, you know, Jamie O'Brien, for example. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. We can name them all. All these young guys are now moving away from comp competition with the exception of selective places and, and going out and just surfing, right? And taking the world with them. Now you can take the world with you, right? And to, to experience it. And I see that as a, as a good thing happening here. Oh, before your question, sorry, the girl's back. I would just like to defend the surf industry uh, because I've worked in philanthropy and there are giving back in a lot, a lot of ways. The Eddie I. Cow Foundation has the Eddie I. Cow Foundation that really does a lot of great work. And they, they have a school essay contest throughout the Hawaiian Islands, 7th through 10th grade, for English speaking, or English written and Hawaiian written. And their motto is there is much good to be done. 
the Duke Gahan Mokos Foundation, there's the Duke's Ocean Fest, which you were speaking of. There's, and I'm blanking on the filters, uh, where surfers go out and, and do those. Uh, oh, my nonprofit to Kanalu. Kirby has a foundation. So there is giving back on that level, and that just like any other business, they have taken huge hits. If anybody, in you know, all those quarterly reports, you can read those. And uh, money-wise, the surf industry and some of those companies took huge hits. But there are foundations out there. There's, there's a, a lot of the surfers have uh, here and there donated their money to causes. Uh, I think Jamie O'Brien, he cystic fibrosis or something one time. He was going to win the pipe. That's what he was going to get his money to. So, All the old ones you're talking about. Yes, yeah, I so named so, so this so organization. There, there are, there is giving back in it, and obviously, hopefully, that will be expounded upon, but it does exist. Yay. <laughs> a couple of things to join on that comment. We had a, a, uh, a conference at San Diego State University in February called Surfing's New Aloha, the growing trend of giving back, where we had a number of brands come and talk about the philanthropy that they do, which is still probably best described as tokenistic at this point, but at least it's taking place. If you have a look behind the scenes of the Volcom Fiji Pro that we saw at the moment, they're doing some pretty cool things. They've actually partnered with an organisation that we developed um, called uh, Surf Credits, where you can give back to local communities um, through our organisation. But what I really wanted to touch on was this idea of surf travel that you talked about, Tom, and I think maybe this is the link between the two films that we might have been grappling with. So we talked about um, Duke and how he went out and um, essentially gave away the sport of surfing with a spirit of, of giving and aloha. And if the first film was anything, it was the growth of professional surfing. If the second film was anything, I think we were left with, okay, the, the legacy of Boyum is commercialised professional surf tourism. Now what we haven't had with the advent of surf tourism and us as surfers going out and surfing these waves all around the world is the spirit of Duke with us. Um, but the Mentua Islands featured in, uh, in the second film and that's an area where surf tourism has gone out and given really very, very, very little back to that local community at all. And often with the antithesis of the spirit of Duke. Rather than going out and gifting surfing to the places that we go, in places like Amentowise, we've been actively encouraged by the people who run those tour operations not to teach the local people to surf, because then they will be crowding out the places that we, give, uh, that we go to. Uh, the Quicksilver Crossing, uh, Jim, I know that in the conceptual stages of that, um, it was put forth that there should be a study done to look at the development of surf tourism and put together a document which could be handed to the places where fantastic surf was found to say, you guys have got a resource. If you manage it properly, it could turn around the economics of your situation. But rather than do that, the thought at the time within Quicksilver was, well, this is going to make people think that we're being greedy and going out and starting up surf camps around the world. So they didn't do that. Now, if you examine that logic a little more closely, in an effort to avoid being perceived as greedy, uh, the company could be perceived as greedy. <laughs> so in order to avoid being perceived as something that was being greedy, they decided not to spend money to give a gift to the local people. So I'm just wondering if anyone has a comment on what's going on with this, is us as travelling surfers and the spirit of Duke in this modern era that Boyum kind of put us onto with the idea of the commercial surf tourism as we propagate out through the world. I think I have to re uh, uh, respond to you first, maybe, <laughs> since you, you refer to the, the, the Quicksilver Crossing, and I was the director of that for a number of years and, and went all around the world with it, and that was the boat that uh, we saw in, in uh, Michael's movie, uh, The Indies Trader, uh, which was called The Raider in, the, in this movie. But one of the things I wanted to say is I think that Quicksilver did a lot of uh, soul searching about what they were going to do, and the reason is, as Paul has pointed out, um, it's a really complicated scenario and not one that's really one you can understand what the consequences will be at a later time. And frequently, surfers have thought they've been doing good things when they've gone out there in the world and actually they've done terrible things. Um, our idea of helping people sometimes isn't what really does help them. So what Quicksilver chose to do 
was, and this was my responsibility, was to put a marine biologist on every uh, portion of that voyage and to go to every single reef we went to and do a reef check, uh, which was started by a gentleman who t actually teaches oceanography here at UCLA uh, and, who, and, and who created a, a system by which you could uh, evaluate from the surface to the, to the, the ocean floor uh, everything about a reef and its health. And we probably did uh, 150 of those with various uh, um, marine biologists all on reefs that had never been, uh, um, had any research done on them before to set a baseline throughout the world. And we gave that to UNESCO, the United Nations uh, uh, group, uh, for their, for their uh, research uh, so that if someone were to go back to these really remote places that we went to or unique areas that we, that we happen to be looking with surf, they would have a baseline. They could say in 2001 or in 2004, this is what that reef looked like. This was the, this was the number of fish, this was the, th this was the kelp beds, this was the water temperature, this was the health of the reef, et cetera, et cetera, and then have that be a measurement against whatever it was later on. And the reason that they chose that was that it was a very politically neutral and sociologically neutral um, effort. Um, what we found is, is that we would go to places and give people things or turn them onto something, and when you'd come back, uh, you'd have Lord of the Flies. And, and as unfortunate as that is, we really don't know, at, particularly with, with our culture, what the effect and what the unintended consequences are going to be on a culture that's never actually experienced any of that. So rather than try to do good and maybe end up not, I think Quicksilver chose to do something that they knew would be unequivocally have a value that would not be uh, in any way a problem later for anyone else. And so that's why they made that choice. Your point is one that's very, very worthwhile talking about, but, but I also think it's one that's incredibly complicated when we talk about cultures and the interactions of cultures, particularly when they're fleeting or they're not, you know, they're not ingrained in, in, in one another. First principle from the Starship Enterprise, interestingly. Well, you know, okay, so since you brought that up in relative to Cook's arrival in the Pacific, that was his standing order, and that's where Star Trek gets it from. Non-interference with the natives you come in contact with. And that's, but he did anything but, and he was in the Pacific for a celestial reason, right? And so he ends up at, you know, what we call New Zealand today to see that. But, uh, I liked your point because I've been on a project with uh, National Geographic for nearly two years, and it's almost based on the same principles, right? Except we're looking at formations of uh, the islands and the reef. So I had an opportunity to do a 6,000-foot dive recently. Uh, that, was, that was very, very fantastic to see the origins of the reef. Yeah, in a submersible. Yeah. Mariana's Islands? Uh, no, mm -hmm. off of uh, the big island, Louis, oh, wow. just last September. So. Uh, we're going to make this the last question. Oh, just a, a point on feasible things to do. Already in the Mentor Islands, boats, you know, pay a tax to the villages. You know, the boat guy comes out and collects a little bit of money. Um, so if we wanted to help the village, we could standardize the tax. So just a much larger, like, cash amount is given to each village. Uh, so that would obviously make the boat trip's a lot more expensive, and we wouldn't like it, and the boat owners would take would make less profits. But uh, the villages would be a lot better off uh, by doing that. So that's, I don't know, if that's feasible. They can do things like build... No, it wouldn't work. you create more inequity within the village itself, because that's, you know, I mean... Be, well, it's not only... It's not the village that gets the money. It's an individual that no, gets the money. Representative of the village. You have their, I mean, these villages... <coughs> have their own political structure oftentimes. They have an elder. You get the tax of that. I mean, you maybe have some worries about some corrupt elders, but a lot of them are just can't starve for resources. They don't have clean water. They don't have wells. They, they don't separate their sanitation from their uh, from their water source because they just don't have the resources to build build a well. So if surfers, you know, if we want to take our responsibilities as not just, you know, an emerging, you know, we're not just surfers trying to pay, you know, keep doing surfing and not work a normal job, but now an emerging sort of culture with responsibilities for our community, then one thing we can do is pony up and pay up to the villages that, that desperately need basic infrastructure. 
or, or the investment in infrastructure rather than straight up uh, cash. Um, I, the hour is growing late. There's a there's a ton of food upstairs. I hope you'll all join us. Uh, just in uh, in concluding, uh, I'll conclude in a slightly humorous note. There was a story this week that Harvard economists were uh, dyeing their hair grey in order to uh, make themselves look more distinguished and to give their scholarship more gravitas. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not one who has that problem, but I want to say when it comes to surfing, none of the people who have spoken today have that problem either. I want to uh, give a profound thank you to everybody who was involved in putting this together. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for you guys.